Welcome to the State Bar of Texas podcast, your monthly source for conversations and curated content to improve your law practice with your host, Rocky Deer. Hi, and welcome to the State Bar of Texas podcast. This is your host, Rocky Deer. Thank you for joining today. I hope you're well. You know, that's something we say very casually. Hope you're well. We write it in emails. Hope all is well. How many of us actually sit down to think about what that means? Wellness. Wishing somebody well. We're going to talk about that today. Wellness is not only a state of being. It's not only a matter of being happy. It's something very important to our practices. Just recently, I remember being a little surprised with news that Dwayne The Rock Johnson, right? Everybody's heard of him. Smell What The Rock Is Cooking, WWE, one of the highest paid actors in Hollywood. He admitted he'd suffered from depression for years. He linked it back to his mother's suicide attempt when he was 15 years old, but the effects lingered with him. And it got me thinking, who else do we know out there who's suffering from some sort of either depression or addiction or something that is just affecting their overall wellness? We're going to talk about that today. We're going to talk about wellness, how to understand it, how to help yourself or how to help others. But I'm not an expert. You know, I'm not an expert on how to help people, but we have some folks that are. First, my co-host today, I'm honored to have her here with us. We've got Bree Buchanan. She's the director for, it's called TLAP. It's the Texas Lawyers Assistance Program. I've got Bree here with me. Bree, thank you for being here. This is an important topic. Can you tell us a little bit more about your background and how you got into the subject of wellness? Sure. It is an important and timely topic. Absolutely. So my day job is uh, I'm the director of the Texas Lawyers Assistance Program of the State Bar of Texas, and it goes by TLAP. I also am currently the chair of the ABA Commission on Lawyers Assistance Programs for the all of the LAPs across the country, and I'm also the co-chair of the National Task Force on Lawyer Wellbeing, which just issued its report last August and was basically endorsed by the ABA at their mid-year meeting, so we're really excited about that. And it's a report with recommendations around lawyer well-being. And you know, you asked how I kind of got into this. Well, I have my own story. Just really quickly, I have a um, long history of dealing with depression and anxiety, particularly that really started and blew up in law school. And what happened over the next couple of decades is that I started dealing with those really uncomfortable and painful feelings with drugs and alcohol and ended up with an addiction. And I've been now in recovery for nine years. And so I'm able to really make a part of my work life uh, my recovery as well. Well, congratulations on your recovery. And I know I'm very happy to hear that you're doing well and that you're helping others. Our guest today, Bree, as as you know, is somebody who needs no introduction to most lawyers, especially lawyers in Texas, but he's been going all over the world, really, trying to raise awareness of this topic. And so I'm hoping that between you and our guest, we can kind of get our arms wrapped around this a little bit and maybe help some folks out there. So are you ready for our guest? Absolutely. So Brian Cuban, if you've not heard the name, you need to look him up. Brian Cuban has got his own story that has brought him to this table to talk about wellness, but he's also the author of The Addicted Lawyer. It's a topic that most of us don't think about. Most of us kind of, you know, there's a stigma, I think. Wouldn't you say, Bree, there's a stigma to the concept of depression and addiction? And Brian has kind of, he's making efforts, and I think he's been very successful in breaking through that barrier and getting us to talk more about it. So, Brian, thank you for being with us today. Thanks for having me here. Brian, can you... Tell us a little bit about your story. Sure. Well, I am a Dallas-based attorney, although I no longer practice. I do still have a license, though. I am in recovery from alcohol and cocaine addiction, substance use disorder. I have been in long-term recovery for 11 years, and those addictions basically took over my life and started well before law school, started in college, the drinking And then the drinking went through law school, and then I discovered cocaine my first uh, summer in Dallas. And they took over my life and really destroyed my career as a practicing lawyer. 
before I finally found recovery in 2007. So Bree, you've been in recovery for nine years and Brian, for you, it's been 11. 11 years, yes. Do you remember the day when you started your recovery? I rem- Yes, I do. I, it was my second trip to a psychiatric facility here in Dallas, Texas, after my girlfriend at that time and now wife came in and we'd only been dating a short time and found me lying in bed with cocaine and alcohol and drugs scattered around the room. We went to Green Oak Psychiatric where I'd been once before when I had become suicidal in 2005 as a result of drugs, alcohol, and clinical depression. And so I was standing in that parking lot, and in that parking lot, I really realized that there wouldn't be a third trip back to that psychiatric facility because I'd be dead. Mm. I realized that I was really close to losing my family because families may love us unconditionally, and we hope they do, but there may be limits on their willingness to watch us destroy our lives. And if, if we're not going to at least try and take that first step into the unknown, into the scary, into recovery, and I realized that I had really reached that point where kind of the gray area between love enablement and recovery had come together and my family had had enough and I didn't want to lose my family. My two brothers, Mark and Jeff, I'm very close with, my mom and my dad, and I didn't want to lose that. And I had really started to distance from them because I didn't want them interfering with my drug use and my drinking and all those things. And I don't know why it was that moment and not say, you know, in 2005 where I had to go to You know, with them when they came in my house and I had a 45 automatic on my nightstand and planned on taking my life. Mm. But it was that moment. And the next day, I began my journey in 12 step, began getting honest with my psychiatrist. I had been lying to my psychiatrist for a couple of years. Well, why would you lie to your psychiatrist, right? Well, shame knows no hourly rate, right? I was ashamed. I wasn't giving him the truth. And I finally started getting honest. And that began my journey into recovery. And since then, it's been a continuous growth process, and I am very happy to be 11 years in. Yeah, and I would say that there's no one who enters recovery is going to forget that moment when they finally reach out and ask for help, because it is the most difficult thing to do, to really get humble and really, like Brian was saying, get honest and be willing to step up and, you know, with what we do at T-Lab, we ask people to, to make a call and ask for help. And it's uh, really, really difficult, especially for lawyers. And it was difficult for me. Uh, T-Lab existed then. I didn't use them. I knew they were... Why not? I knew they were around. I really didn't understand it, though, because there was... I had isolated. I had really lost... My, you know, I wasn't interacting with lawyers anymore. I didn't know what was out there, although I kind of knew they you know, were there, but I really didn't understand what they were about. And no, none of my colleagues stepped forward at any time to say, hey, this is what you might consider. I see you're struggling, which is something I talk about today, our obligation to use our gift of empathy to encourage our colleagues to seek help. Why is that? I mean, for, you know, Bree, Brian, either or both of you, why do you think it's hard for those that are, I guess, for lack of a better term, on the periphery? of somebody who is suffering from these issues. Why is it hard for us to recognize those signs and then step in and intervene? Well, Bree, if do you want to, I have my anecdotal experience on that. If Bree wants to jump in. Sure. I think it's really difficult for us when we see a colleague struggling to take the action of stepping forward and asking them, how are they doing? And can you help? And there are a variety of reasons for that. One of them is that we think it's none of our business. Um, We don't want to embarrass the other person. We don't want to embarrass ourselves because still these medical conditions, there's still so much stigma and shame wrapped up that we're afraid to even speak up and have a conversation about this, which is, to me, in my mind, just kind of a crazy situation that we're still dealing with. And people also, you know, besides the just it's not my business, they're thinking, well, I'm not an expert. You know, and lawyers, we like to be experts about everything. And so there's the idea, well, I'm not, I didn't go to law school to be able to diagnose this. So who am I to come in and speak up to this person? So there's, those are a couple of things. And then the idea of um, this is messy stuff and it's painful stuff. And if the person says yes. I am suffering from, you know, fill in the blank, then what? 
We don't feel competent to handle these issues. And what I have also seen, to add a number four to this, is that we project a response. We project a negative response. Mm. We project an angry response. We project mm, yeah. a, I'm going to sue you for defamation response. Right. Right. And so it be, and yeah. rather than deal with the response, it becomes the path of least resistance becomes to say, it becomes easiest to just say nothing. So I'm going to throw something out there to the two of you as kind of maybe additional factors. And admittedly, to my knowledge, I do not have an addiction or a depression issue, at least to my knowledge. You never know. There may be something lurking deep inside any one of us that we're not aware of. So I'm coming at this as the proverbial layman. But I feel like if I was going to go to somebody and say, are you suffering from depression or addiction? And those are two separate things as I understand it, right? Two separate illnesses, depression and addiction. Yes, correct. So if I was to ask either one of those, I'd be afraid that the other person would feel offended. Absolutely. Or right. if I was to or if I was to to say, well, this person might be suffering from depression or addiction, I'd be afraid that person well, let me rephrase that. I think people sometimes use that as a weapon where they say, well, my opposing counsel, I think must have an addiction problem or a depression problem because they wouldn't be yeah. doing X, Y, or Z if that wasn't the case. Yeah, well, here's what I think is really important in regards to that is we tell people, when I say we, I mean TLAP, it's really important to not try to diagnose and to never say to somebody, I think you've got an alcohol addiction. Hmm. The issue is because we are not confident to do that, and the only thing that that's going to do is raise defenses and hackles and enforce denial more. What we coach people to do about having what we call a difficult conversation is to say, you know, Joe, I've known you for a long time, and I really respect you as a lawyer, and I've noticed that over the past six months that you're kind of acting differently. I've noticed that you're not coming in to work regularly, and you just seem really down, and I'm worried about you. What's going on? Is there anything I can do to help? And come at them with a strong sense of openness, of curiosity, and a desire to be helpful and uh, express compassion and empathy like Brian was talking about. And that is going to be more likely to get a response and know you may not get, uh, you know, you're right, I'm depressed and I'm going to go to treatment now. Sometimes it's just the beginning of an ongoing conversation, but you've let that person know that someone has noticed that they're having problems and that there's somebody out there who cares and is willing to actually step into the breach and have a conversation with them. I totally agree with that. And what I also encourage is within that conversation, let them know twice at the beginning and the end that you are there because within a conversation, somebody can change their mind that quickly. Mm. Okay. So have that empowering, I'm here if you want to talk moment twice within the same conversation. And somebody may respond angrily. Mm. I, I, I've gotten those responses and there's nothing you can do about it. That's not about you. And I think it's important right. for us to realize that when we approach somebody and we get an angry response or we, we get a deflective response, it's not about us. And mm -hmm. so that we shouldn't use that to suddenly go radio silent on the issue. You may get eight angry responses, but the first time you get that, you're right, thank you, I would like to explore help, you've changed a life. Now let's talk for a second about warning signs, or maybe signs that those of us, again, on the periphery of somebody who may be suffering from these issues, what should we be looking for to kind of give us the yellow flags or possible red flags that there might be a problem and we need to reach out? You're going to see things that in your gut you start to notice that there may be something wrong. Sometimes, certainly not all the times, there's the the sort of standard telltale sign of somebody with alcohol on their breath, or you see them drinking in mm. the bathroom. That happens, mm. but more often you're going to see people start to be late to work, unexplained absences from work, um, calls not being responded to, emails are unanswered, Perhaps you may see inappropriate responses to circumstances so that they may react very angrily to a situation that just didn't call for that. Sometimes it's a disheveled appearance. The way they're 
maintaining their hygiene has taken a turn for the worse. And a lot of times it's going to be a combination of these factors such that because we are just human beings and we are attuned to people, we start to get a feeling there's just something not right. And that's all you need to know to be able to approach them and just say, how are you doing? I'm worried about you. And Bree brings up an important point here is that there is no magic thing. I get asked that all the time. What is that one thing I need to look for that tells me? The magic pill. And there is one. It is going to be your knowledge of the person and the context around that person works, lives that person's life, how that behavior has changed, mm. and the things that go along with that change in behavior. And those are going to raise the red flags. There is rarely going to be just one thing unless you know you see something that is just anyone would notice you know, relating to being intoxicated or something like that. It is usually a combination of things within the circumstances and within the context that raises the red flags. And what I would encourage people to do is when you get that feeling that there's something wrong, approach them, have a basic conversation, and if you're rebuffed, say, okay, thanks, I just care about you and I was worried. Um, And then maybe check back and say, hey, let's go to lunch. Let's go have a cup of coffee and maintain a relationship with them and keep that door open and the line of communication open. And as a footnote to all of this, I really encourage lawyers who start to have this feeling, I'm worried about, you know, Joe down the hall, to call TLAP and we can strategize and consult with you. you. We don't have to know Joe down the hall's name. You don't even have to tell us your name. We're here and available all the time just to strategize and help you figure out what is the right path to take. Yes, and that's what I was going to add, and you filled those gaps nicely, Bree. There's, when you're at that point of, I think, I don't know what to say, that's, you know, it doesn't become full stop. You go to someone who can coach you in what to say. That's why we have TLAP. That's why we have Bree. That's why we have, have that there for you to call them, and it's all confidential, and they will help you find the words. So it, I'm going to, I'm going to, kind of confess something here, which is if I saw somebody who was not answering emails, not answering phone calls late everywhere, I would either think that they're just very, very stressed and overwhelmed with whatever's going on in their lives. Or I might think they're just, they're just being lazy and they're, they're not being, they're they're not being good lawyers or, but you would notice something is up, right? Mm, True. True. So, Whatever your preconceptions are, the question is still the same. I notice something's going on. Do you want to talk? So then do we, do we need to be careful not to just jump to the ideas yes. of depression and addiction and just say, hey, what's wrong and keep it open? We need to be careful not to judge what anyone's going through because then it becomes about accusation and not about empathy right. and not about just getting right. the story. So much of this really is getting back to us just being human beings with one another. And the idea that we start to care for our own, sometimes they'll talk about us, so we need to be our brothers and sisters keeper. Another thing that I'll say, especially when I'm talking about suicide awareness and prevention, is that we need to stop minding our own business. (laughs) We are charged with being a self-governing profession, and a piece of that responsibility is that we look out for one another and help one another when we have trouble. The only reason I am here today on this podcast is because three people did not mind their own business. And who were those three people for you? My uh, very good friend who I dedicated my first book to for saving my life and my two brothers. Mm. They did not mind their own business when I was at that point of, in my mind, thinking I was a burden on my family and they would be better off without me. And I had a weapon on my nightstand. They did not mind their own business and got me the help I needed. Brian, in your case, let's, let's talk a bit about your background story because this may resonate with someone, someone may know somebody who's in this position, and I don't think your story can be told enough. So your story with addiction and depression, it actually goes back to childhood in your case. Correct. And I have to confess, Brian and I have known each other for, it's almost 10 years now, I think. Mm -hmm. It's been a long time. So it started with body dysmorphic disorder. Correct. My journey does go back to childhood, not in terms of the drinking and drugs, but in terms of... 
I was very shy, very middle child syndrome. There was bullying in my childhood. I was actually physically assaulted over my weight. I was mm. a heavy set kid, uh, difficult relationships at home, though that is not to blame parents for any of this. Parents don't cause addiction, parents don't cause, I've also suffered from eating disorders, bulimia and uh, exercise bulimia. Parents don't cause eating disorders. There is a difference between cause and correlation. Mm -hmm. But home environment and how we're treated at home and bullying can correlate with a lot of feelings that can lead to disorders. So being a very shy child who was fat shamed and who was bullied, I developed anorexia in 1979 as a freshman at Penn State, long before anyone was talking about it. The singer Karen Carpenter passed away from complications related to anorexia in 1983 and kind of brought it into the pre-digital national spotlight. This was before even that. And then I transitioned into binging and purging bulimia. And then I became exercise bulimic, which is the obsessive compulsive exercise for the primary purpose of offsetting calories. I was oh, wow. running 10 miles a day, 20 miles a day. And this was all wrapped around the development of body dysmorphic disorder. What body dysmorphic disorder is, is a DSM-5, that is a psychological disorder in which someone exaggerates a aspect of their perceived appearance in their reflection to the point where it affects their ability to function quote unquote normally in life. For me, because I was fat shamed and bullied over my weight, no matter how thin I got or no matter how muscular I got, I became addicted to steroids as well. Oh wow! I still okay. saw this fat little boy in the mirror. So I cycled through all these destructive behaviors trying to basically love that little boy and love myself, which I could never find. And that led also to becoming an out quote unquote alcoholic at Penn State. I was drinking every night. I was drinking in the morning. I was going to class drunk. I was going to class hungover. Fortunately, I was able to do okay at Penn State and kind of uh, give back information, pulling an all nighter before an exam. It doesn't work in law school, right? <laughs> and so I decided I would go on to pit law, not because I wanted to be a lawyer, not because I wanted to change the world, not because I wanted to make a lot of money, but because I wanted to survive day to day. And it made perfect sense to me that I could spend three years in law school and I could just repeat the same behaviors, binging and purging, drinking, running 20 miles a day, and not have to give up ownership of any of my disorders to anyone. But then what happened after law school? Because then you're... You're in the, quote, real world, right? Well, I barely graduated from Pitt Law, as you might imagine. Uh, I wasn't a very good student. I did my trial mood court drunk. I was going to class drunk. I was going to class hunk over, repeating the exact same cycles as at Penn State because that's all I had. That's all I knew. I wasn't in recovery. I had no concept of recovery. And then when I moved to Dallas, Texas, after graduating, uh, I discovered cocaine. I studied for the Texas bar. I took it out in Fort Worth the first time. My study age for the Texas bar, the first time I took it were three and a half ounces of cocaine, a mm. bottle of Jack Daniels and a liter of Tab and some borrowed Barbie books. So as wow. you might imagine, I did not pass and mm. I failed it twice actually. All relating to is more important to engage in drug and alcohol use than study and, and pass because I really didn't care. I, I was just surviving. I was repeating cycles right up through then. And was there a history of any of this in your family? No, I have no history of addiction in my family. We know that genetics can account for about 50% of predisposition to addiction. There's no way to know for sure, but in my mind, looking back on my story, I would say the majority was environmentally triggered just because there is no genetic history that I'm aware of. Bree, how about you? Did you have a, a family history of any of this or was this... Was this hitting you alone? I did. I did. I had my uh, father was an alcoholic, and so I had the genetic predisposition for this. And I talked to people, I, I talked to my son, who's 21, mm. about the idea that if you have a genetic predisposition towards this, and then effectively you pour a lot of alcohol on top of that for a good number of years, you have created an alcoholic. I mean, that's not the only way that you get one, but that is a surefire way to get to a very severe alcohol use disorder to use the current nomenclature. So we've really got two stories here. One, which was a complete surprise, Brian, in your case, because there was no family history. You didn't know there was any predisposition towards no, anything. No, no. Everything, every destructive behavior I engaged in revolved around trying to soothe the pain of a little boy. And then Bree, in your case... 
there's a family history there. And he said something very interesting, which is that if you've got a genetic predisposition and then you feed that that predisposition with the addictive substance that is the subject of that addiction, then you've effectively created an addicted person. That's very, it's very simplified. But yeah, if you do that in large quantities over an extended period of time. Okay. Yeah. The reason I'm, I'm asking about that is, you know, I think because there's a shame and a stigma attached with these issues of addiction and depression, do you think that lends people to thinking, oh, it's, you know, whoever the addicted person is, it's their fault. They should have known better than to drink too much or to get involved in drugs or whatever. Does sure. That there are those who think, and again, this goes back to a much deeper conversation about the etiology of addiction. We have the disease model. Mm -hmm. Uh, which is the accepted AMA model that addiction is a brain disease, but we have people who view addiction as a moral failing mm. and that addiction is a choice. And I, when I talk to people, I tell them, was the first time I used cocaine in the bathroom of a hotel in Dallas, Texas, and instantly became psychologically addicted, not physically dependent, that's different. And that would come later. Okay. The first time I became psychologically addicted, was that first line a choice, a pure choice? Of course it was. Now, it was a choice influenced by a lot of psychological issues that, that made me think I had no choice, but it was a choice. The process that took over when I did it in my brain that started firing signals that I looked in the mirror and finally saw someone after, you know, decades of hating what he saw in the mirror, suddenly loved what he saw in the mirror. Because of the cocaine. Because of the cocaine. That that's a, was one of the most powerful feelings I'd ever experienced in myself. That feeling of self-love artificially induced that I'd never experienced before. Who wouldn't want to have that again? And I had to have it again yeah. and again and again. And that was the psychological addicted addiction, but my brain would rewire for that. And I did become physically dependent. And I think it's really important at this point to point out that, yes, unfortunately, there are some people who are stuck in mid-20th century thinking that these addictions are moral failings, but again, the AMA has classified these as medical conditions, disorders, alcohol use disorder, substance use disorder, and they've been doing that for a long time. And so the idea that these are, like I said, moral failings are very outdated. And really, they're looking at just models that are no longer appropriate or accurate and certainly do so much damage in trying to get people to come forward and ask for help. It is the stigma and the shame that almost inexplicably still in the you know 2018 that is attached to these medical conditions that are killing people. I see lawyers die every year because they are too afraid and too ashamed to pick up the phone and ask for help. This outmoded way of viewing things is killing lawyers and killing people across the country. And I just have to pull up my soapbox about that because I've, I, I sit here on the phone at the Lawyers Assistance Program and I get these calls and I read the reports of lawyers dying and I spend every day, and I know Brian does too, to stop that litany of news articles about lives being destroyed. And let's make no mistake now about this. That. There is a demographic of our profession who believe that addiction is a moral failing. Mm. They, they just do. And I don't know, we don't have a study on that, but I can tell you anecdotally sure. that I know lawyers who believe it is. And so mm -hmm. within our own yeah. profession, we are dealing with that stigma and have to fight against yeah. that. Yeah, I know. Brian, I had a question I wanted to ask you and just exploring this some more. How do you think we can get you know, more lawyers to ask for help for themselves? I mean, we talked about how do lawyers go and have the difficult conversation, but how do we get lawyers and law students and even judges who are experiencing things to pick up the phone and ask for help or go somewhere and ask for help? Thank you, Bree. That's a huge question. Wow. There's no magic pill to that, but I think the power of storytelling is a powerful motivator to people, and we need more lawyers, more law students speaking up. Now, one of the issues, of course, is like for me, Brian, I have nothing to lose, right? I'm not practicing. People are like, okay, well, he has nothing to lose. A, a lawyers, we have the stigma. Lawyers may silently t on uh, in a social media anonymously talk about it, but they may be reticent to speak up because they have jobs. 
And they're mm. afraid, the stigma, they're afraid of losing their job, they're afraid of losing a partnership track. Clients. A law, mm. a law student has the stigma of character and fitness they're afraid of. Mm -hmm. And so we have all these barriers, say barriers to entry to breaking stigma that, that have to be broken as well to put forth the message. Does that make sense, Bree? It does. And I'll have to say, you know, I have, I have a dream <laughs> that <laughs> someday in the very near future, we're going to start seeing the way these disorders are viewed like other medical conditions, which are, you know, chronic, treatable, uh, not curable, just like diabetes or some forms of cancer I, I or agree. heart disease. I yeah, agree. we and, need to get there. And a good illustration of, of the dichotomy of the stigma here is the recent article, was it the Quinn Emanuel partner who came out about depression? There, there was a mm -hmm. big article about a partner, I believe it was a Quinn Emanuel who came out about how he was suffering depression, encouraging mm -hmm. people to come forward. Good luck finding a lawyer who is currently employed who would do that about substance use. Well, and so if I could play devil's advocate, because you know I'm sitting here nodding my head at everything you're both saying, but I'm trying to, and again, I'm coming at this completely untrained, but I'm trying to put myself in the position of somebody who needs help. So, you know, Bree, you, you made the analogy with diabetes, but a diabetic lawyer can still successfully represent clients as long as they're taking their insulin and they're managing their diets. But imagine a lawyer who says, I'm suffering or I'm about to suffer from dementia or I'm at early stage Alzheimer's. And well, that's going to affect his or her ability to actually represent clients. Yeah. Now, when we're talking about the stigma and somebody seeking help, if I'm suffering from addiction, I might be afraid that my clients, once I come out with that, my clients might choose other counsel because they don't want a lawyer who's got an addiction issue. How do you overcome that well, if you're in the trenches? Well, first, let's separate out the dementia and Alzheimer's. Let's separate the dementia right. and Alzheimer's issue because of the nature of that, of that, no lawyer would probably say that. It would be other people having to notice it. Uh, having, yeah, it's a, di a completely it's, different it's a, animal. And mm. it's a different animal we're going to have to deal with as the baby boomers age, but it's, it's another issue. Well, I'm trying to draw the analogy with with. I was going to ask you to diseases. repeat the question. Well, sure. So, you know, I'm, I'm trying to draw the analogy with so the analogy that Bree drew was with diabetes, you know, addiction and how diabetes is illness. Well, you have to illness. remember, okay, the disease model, does addiction have different characteristics than diabetes and this as a, within the disease model? Of course it does. Right. There are different correlations. People, I, I'm very honest about this, you know, there is not a high correlation with offending with diabetes, right? Right, right. So we, ha we acknowledge that there are these differences, but people get caught up in that instead of going to the basic biological rewiring of the brain of why it's a disease. Does that, do you agree with well, that, Bree? I, oh, sorry, go yeah. ahead, Bree. Yeah, I think what happens is that when you have exposed to these chemicals over an extended period of time, there are actual structural and chemical changes to the brain. And science is really clear on those things. I guess my question, guys, is, all right, so if I'm the client, all right, and if I've got a lawyer who says, you know, I'm, I'm talking to my lawyer and she says, you know what, I have to tell you, I'm suffering from depression or, you know, I've been suffering from an addiction. As a client, I might be inclined to say, you know, look, I wish you well, you know, God love you, but I've got to find another lawyer. And so that might stop lawyers from wanting to admit that they have a problem in the first place. The, the projection. And, I, and the, I can see that there's a fear there, yes. but I will tell you, having counseled lawyers over the past eight years in this area, what actually happens is very different. Clients love it when the lawyers are honest with them. And the piece of this has to be, of course, not just that, you know, I'm an alcoholic, but the idea that I'm an alcoholic and I'm in treatment and I'm in recovery, of course, there's really actually not mm. much of a reason that you would ever need to say that to a client, but let's say that you decide that's necessary for whatever reason. You know, these are conditions that are manageable and treatable. If somebody is in long-term recovery and is getting the type of program that they need to go through, you will in talking to people in long-term recovery, you're going to find out that they are better lawyers than they have ever been because of this, the structure and the, the types of tools that they implement into their lives. 
Absolutely. And let's not kid ourselves here. Clients, everyone knows somebody in long-term recovery. Everyone knows somebody. It's not like this happens in a vacuum mm. where it only happens to lawyers. The problem with that kind of projection of stigma is lawyers project out the fear, then they start kicking the can of recovery down the road. Okay. And then suddenly it turns into conduct mm. where right. the, con the consequences have now caught up with the problem. And now you are going to lose the client. Now there's a malpractice. Now it's risk management. Okay. Mm. Right. And so right. that's so, when it becomes so the problem. So our whole idea here is to get people to step forward and ask for help before it gets so extreme. And currently, because the stigma and the shame, what I see happens too often is that lawyers wait until they have lost everything. They will first lose their family, their children, multiple jobs, a house. And it's only when they're getting to the point sometimes when they're about to lose their license or their career that they finally are at the bottom. You know, things are painful enough that they're willing to ask for help. And we need to shift that paradigm where at the first sign of trouble or the second sign of trouble, they're coming forward and getting help. And there are resources everywhere. There are so many different types of programs for people who are experiencing these problems. There's inpatient that we all know about. There's outpatient. There's day programs. There's 12-step programs. There's peer support programs. It's everywhere. People just need to be willing to ask for help and realize that it's not the end of the world. It's the beginning of a new and flourishing way of life. Absolutely. And, and in society and recovery, we've embraced this stereotype of quote unquote rock bottom where recovery doesn't have to happen until the worst happens in someone's life when they've hit rock bottom. Because I get asked all the time, what's your rock bottom? Was that your, you know, I prefer recovery tipping point. Hmm. So that runs contrary to what has Bree has said that we have to find ways to bring empower people to seek help at the highest possible level of performance before it gets to quote unquote rock bottom as a stereotype of the worst happening in our lives. Yeah, and I just want to take a moment to recognize Brian in this and the incredibly courageous work he does because I looked a lot at what works and breaking through and breaking down stigma. And it's what Brian is doing. It is putting a face on long-term recovery and getting out there and saying, this is me, this is what my life was like, and this is what I've done and what it's like now. And being, and being able to, for people to see, wow, he's a great guy. And I really wish what I had what he has right now. And, and being able to put a face on that is what will end the stigma. Absolutely. And thank you, Bree. I appreciate those kind words. And I want to circle back because one of the problems we have now, not so much with depression, because depression is, I think, less stigmatized in the legal profession than, than addiction, mm -hmm. although it is very stigmatized. Mm -hmm. A lawyer is not going to wor necessarily worry about losing his job as much if he talks about being depressed and decides he's going to come out. Right. As I said earlier, try finding a lawyer who is currently employed, mm -hmm who currently is doing well, who is going to put his current face and say, I am in long-term recovery from alcohol or drugs. Maybe alcohol, certainly not drugs. Right. That, that is and a much- And I will have one for you. Good. I will, let's come back on this show and I will have one. I'll have more than one. Good, because be in my experience, that is a very difficult barrier for lawyers because of the stigma. They don't want to- jeopardize anything, and especially with uh, substance use. Well, and Brian, you've not just put a face to the issue, you've actually put your face and your name on a book, right? So it's called The Addicted Lawyer. We've talked about this before, you and I kind of individually. If you could tell us for a second, who needs to be reading this? Because it says The Addicted uh, Lawyer. I hate, Is to, it, I hate to pander to my own book. Well, <laughs> well no, it's, it's, it's not about pandering. What, what I'm asking is, who's your intended audience? Because you're Law saying students the and lawyers. Because you're saying the addicted lawyer. Yeah. So is it is it geared towards lawyers or is it's it? It's geared towards law students and lawyers. The addicted lawyer is not a pure memoir. It, it's about 75% memoir, my story. But it also has stories from other law students and lawyers in recovery dealing with everything from alcohol to cocaine to heroin. It has advice from those who represent lawyers and law students in the disciplinary system. It has advice in general, recovery advice. So it is a book meant to be not just a entertainment memoir, although, you know, how many people have traded Dallas Mavericks championship tickets for cocaine? Come on. <laughs> so I'm assuming you're one of them. I'm, I'm the only one yeah. in this country, I think. 
So I, I have some humorous stories in there, but the overall point of the book is to let people know that they are not alone and to give practical advice to people who are struggling and things they can do. I talk about TLAP. I talk about all kinds of place, you know, different recovery, uh, peer assistance, 12 step smart recovery and different things law students and lawyers can do. Yeah, and I want the listeners also to know that if they want to get more information about TLAP, our website is tlaphelps.org, and you can find that, use that as a portal to access services with us. And that's T-L-A-P, helps with an uh-huh. S, dot org. And Bree, I want to backtrack. It, when I talk about lawyers who are unwilling to put a face to it, I, I, I think in terms of full name. So I'm thinking in terms of, okay, my name is first name, last name, here's what I'm going through. I'm sure. Oh no! I'm going to get you. I'll get you people that'll do their full name. Oh great! Okay, I, I would love. I would love to. I would love to get their stories <laughs> yeah. out there. I would, it sounds I, like we've got part yeah. two of the podcast yeah, I, I would, already. I would love do already it. done. Yeah, this let's is great. do it. We 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 need more voices, and we need more voices with names and faces behind them. Well, and I got to tell you, as again, as somebody who's a layperson looking at this, I want to learn more about this. I mean, there's it's a whole other world for for a lot of people that they're just unaware of, but. You could both comment on this, but I know, Brian, with your book, you said it's it's geared towards lawyers and law students. So let's talk for a second about what's special or unusual for lawyers and law students dealing with addiction and depression versus people who may not be in our profession. Special or unusual? Well, we have our own unique stressors to our profession. The law students have their own unique stressors and triggers in law school. But what is unique to us as a profession, I think, is that we are, as lawyers, we tend to not like to allow ourselves to be vulnerable. As law students, we tend to not like to allow ourselves to be vulnerable. You think that's special to our profession? We view vulnerability as a weakness. Yeah, we are expected to be warriors. I mean, that's what we're trained to do, to put on armor and go out there and fight for our clients. And so we can't show vulnerability. We can't show a chink in the armor. And that starts to become inculcated to us from the time that we enter the law school world. And it's not just a legal profession. Vulnerability, the ability to, to be vulnerable is one of the gatekeepers to recovery across the board. But as a True. profession, we, are, we don't like to do that. We take advantage in the adversarial process of right. vulnerability. We don't allow ourselves to be vulnerable. Absolutely. So how do we as lawyers overcome that, I guess? Yeah, I think that there's, you can look, I'm inspired by some of the models that come out of the military, and there's warriors programs, and the idea of changing how we frame this, that the courageous thing to do is step up and ask for help. When the warrior gets in trouble, they don't just curl in a ball and hunker down, they ask for help. Ask and for we need up. to reframe this and start thinking about it in a different way. And Bree is absolutely correct. And it circles back to the one of the first things we talked about. It. It's a, incumbent upon us as a profession to let our colleagues know that it's okay to be vulnerable. What can law firms do? What do you think a law firm could do to, to help people? Well, there, uh, there are quite a few things in the task force report, so I'll let Bree take that. <laughs> <laughs> and there's actually, um, it's exciting times for this whole topic. The ABA president, Hillary Bass, has a working group to advance lawyer well-being. And a piece of that, we're working on model policy on impairment that should go before the ABA in August and be uh, adopted as a model for the whole country. And the idea here is for law firms to address this and look at it head on. Again, this is something that lawyers say, I didn't go to law school to deal with this. But it, given that the rate of problematic drinking in this country is one in five for lawyers, all lawyers, one in three of lawyers under 30, we've got to open our eyes and address it. And so you set out in a policy, what is the protocol within the law firm? If you're worried about somebody, well, who do you take that to? Who do you go talk to? setting out what is the law firm going to do for that individual lawyer. Are they able to take leave? Clarify that. Uh, Set out the conditions under which they come back to work and and just make it very clear. And we know that this is going to happen given the high statistics, so let's just plan for it. 
Also, another thing that the task force on lawyer well-being is encouraging law firms to do is make this a priority and the way that you make it a priority, not just with a model policy on the impairment piece, but build into the infrastructure and the governance structure of the law firm that they're going to address well-being for their firm, whatever that may look like. And so you may have a well-being czar, a well-being managing partner, or there may be a a committee that's looking at these issues for the firm and how they're going to address that. I mean, lawyers are incredibly resourceful and brilliant. And if we just have something, a task on our to-do list, we're going to succeed. We're going to accomplish it. The issue is not to micromanage with the law firms and tell them what it is exactly they need to be doing, although there's plenty of folks that would, <laughs> would like to do that. But just say, make this a priority, and you figure out what does this look like for your firm and your lawyers. Another thing that is happening nationally is we're developing a pledge program or campaign for lawyers, law firms, sorry, to start addressing well-being issues for their employees and making a pledge to do so and making it something by which clients can judge the value of the law firm. It's something that was done nationally in the past few years around diversity and inclusion, mm. which creates an ex- excellent model for us. And so nationally, the plan is to carry that forward and get law firms to step forward and say, we are taking action to make sure that our lawyers are healthy and in good conditions to be able to provide the absolute best services possible to our clients. Because well-being of the lawyer is really gets down to the core duty of our ability to provide competent representation to our clients. And we can take that a step back further and that law schools are also looking at the same thing, what they can do because these issues are often systemic and that these issues are often culturalized dating back to college or maybe somebody's even using drinking and, and substances mm-hmm. as a way to deal with stress starting before college. Mm. And so you know, the students with these problems, you know, I say it all the time, addicted law students become addicted lawyers if there's not some type of intervention. So law schools are looking at ways as well to empower students to help each other and recover and change the culture of drinking Mm. that is prevalent at so many schools. When I was at Pitt Law, we had hard alcohol happy hours right in the student lounge. I mean, this was back in the 80s, and that doesn't happen now. But So the culture has changed some, but there's still a culture of drinking. And so the culture of drinking becomes the same culture of using alcohol to relieve stress at the practice level. And law schools are starting to look at wellness committees. I think there are five or six law schools that have actual counselors full time on staff. Hmm. So, but just five or six. Yes, obviously in a perfect budgetary world, right? You'd like to see more, but the reality is of budgeting, and we would hope that as we move forward and this becomes more of a topic, a more talked about issue, that they will find money in budgets to do these same things. Now, Bree, if I could ask you just just to clarify. If somebody calls into TLAP, either for someone else or for themselves, then who all do you have to report that to? No one. Exactly. And thank you for that question. It is so important. Everything that we do, all the communications are completely wrapped in confidentiality. We do not, cannot, will not report or turn over any information regarding a lawyer that we're trying to help or any lawyer who calls about another lawyer or law student they're concerned for to anyone. We're behind, you know, double locked doors. We don't keep records. We don't keep notes. There is no file open or case open when we talk to a lawyer. You know, it is confidentiality is everything that we do. So to answer the question just head on, do we ever provide information or turn over names to discipline or the character and fitness of the board of law examiners? And the answer is absolutely no, never, ever. Even if there's an ethics violation? Let's say that somebody calls in and says... Even if. Okay. Wow. Right. And, and Bree, right. how do we break through the demographic of those who say, I don't care what Bree says, I don't care what they have on their website... I just don't trust it. Sure. How do we break through that? So what we do with that is that we will speak to people anonymously. 
you know, we're not, we don't do an intake when people call. I don't, please don't give me your bar number. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, what your name is or your identifiers is not of relevance to us. So if you want to call, if you really just don't believe it, okay, well, call us and speak to us anonymously, and we don't have to have your name and date of birth to give you referrals, which we can do to providers in your area. It'd be great if you said, for instance, I'm in Dallas, that would be helpful, so we could give you, you know, treatment programs or a psychiatrist or psychologist. Um, but we're really just here to help, and so we're going to do that in any way we can and at whatever level a person is open to and willing to engage in. It's funny. There's an anecdote I like to tell. I This was a while ago. I was talking to a trial lawyer, and he said, Brian, I don't care what you say. TLAP's not confidential. I said, how do you know that? Well, a lawyer told me. Well, how does he know that? Well, I think he, someone may have told him. So you're a trial lawyer, and you're coming to me with a guy told a guy who told a guy Triple hearsay. That, that, <laughs> that it's not confidential. But that illustrates the stigma. That right. illustrates the fear. Yeah. Objection yeah, sustained. The, fear. Fear <laughs> the, the jury yeah. does not hear that one. Okay. We're kind of nearing the end of our time, which I very much regret because this is, I hate to use the word fascinating, but it is a fascinating topic. And yet it's so serious and has such wide ranging effects on, on a huge demographic yeah. in our bar. Hey, I could talk about this all day. Do another one. We'll be happy to have you back, and <laughs> and Bree, you've been you've been an amazing co-host here. So, you know, we'd love Thank to have you. have both of you back to maybe do part two. And Bree, you can bring some of those some of those lawyers that that, that would Brian be wonderful. I think as many voices as possible, as many voices Absolutely. as possible, encourages other voices. Well, good, good. Right, right. Get a critical mass. That's right. Now, I, I want to make sure that people know about this. All right. So, if you're listening. If you're concerned that you or another member of the profession is struggling with a substance use or mental health disorder, you can call the Texas Lawyers Assistance Program, that's TLAP, confidentially and even anonymously. So get a pen and paper or open up your smartphone and take down this number, 1-800-343-8527. Again, that's 1-800-343-8527. Or go to the website, TLAP Helps with an S. So T L A P H E L P S dot org for more information. You might be able to help yourself, you might be able to help someone else, but please keep those numbers and that website handy. It could save a life. <laughs> Looks like in Brian's case and in Bree's case, it has definitely made a big impact on them. So thank you both for being uh, here. Bree, you've been you've been a rock star. Thank you. Thank you. And Brian, as always, thank you for everything you're doing. You've both been very courageous to, to come on it's, here and to get your voice heard. It's always an honor to come on and share my story. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. And thank you for listening to the State Bar of Texas podcast. If you like what you just heard and enjoyed this programming, you can find us and a lot of other great content at LegalTalkNetwork.com. And also please remember to rate us in Apple Podcasts and or follow us on Twitter or Facebook. Thank you again for being with us today. Take care and be well. If you'd like more information about today's show, please visit LegalTalkNetwork.com. Go to TexasBar.com slash podcasts. Subscribe via Apple Podcasts and RSS. Find both the State Bar of Texas and Legal Talk Network on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Or download the free app from Legal Talk Network in Google Play and iTunes. The views expressed by the participants of this program are their own and do not represent the views of, nor are they endorsed by, the State Bar of Texas, Legal Talk Network, or their respective officers, directors, employees, agents, representatives, shareholders, or subsidiaries. None of the content should be considered legal advice. As always, consult a lawyer. And I yeah, just yeah, realized, yeah. I'm sorry. and I don't know why it just occurred to me that I didn't know that this was just audio, so I didn't have to wear a suit. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. So, yeah. Okay. <laughs> At least we you know that you look good. Yeah. <laughs> At least you didn't come in complaining about where the hair and makeup people, you know. <laughs> I even shaved this morning because I thought this was... Me. I know, I know.